It is good to be together. Uh, this, this is not directed at anyone in this church, I promise you. You're going to think it is, but it's not. In a, in a previous church, every time I say that, someone's like, they're talking about me. I promise you, this is a previous church, and this is many, many years ago. Uh, there, there was a, I, I won't tell you what church, and I won't tell you what, what person. Uh, they, they are, as far as I know, uh, I don't think they live anymore. So if you're living and breathing today, you know I'm not talking about you. Uh, we, we had a gentleman in, in the church who was known as what we would call a conversational hostage taker. And what I mean by that is our staff actually made his name, his last name, into a noun. So getting stuck, even outside of the church context, if you got stuck in a never-ending conversation with someone who wouldn't stop talking, it was called getting stuck in a his last name, right? It was kind of defined after him. The way that we say that we're going to FaceTime somebody, right? Like it's just a synonymous kind of thing. And so our church staff would constantly be stuck in it. And, you know, what was so impressive was that not only... Could, could he hold you in a conversation after church for 45 minutes when there's 16 people clearly next to you waiting to talk to you as, as a church staff person? But he had an ability to carry a conversation across like 65 different topics in a matter of those 45 minutes, right? It, it, was, it was staggering what he would do, right? Do you know anyone like that? Someone who could just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk with no cohesion? You're thinking like, well, our pastor's kind of like that, right? But, but he'll go from the weather to the worst weather they ever saw to how weather patterns work to how his dad was a meteorologist to the affair that his dad had while he was a meteorologist to how it's all the government's fault. All in a matter of just a few key minutes. And it was staggering to watch that kind of display of conversational prowess. Let's see if these work today. They do. So last week, we, we started the book of James, and, and James can sometimes appear to be this kind of a guy, right? You, you get into reading the book of James, and, and, and James is not a cohesive writer. Most of the New Testament authorship is very well written by people that are just grammar awesome, right? Almost poets of their day. Like when you read the, the, the words of Paul or John, the Gospel of John, I mean, read John 1, right? The first chapter, and you just go, Wow. There's a cohesion and a, and a poetic nature to this. It just flows beautifully. And the theme of God as, 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 the, as Jesus as God is woven through the whole book. And you can kind of see how even though he goes on different tangents, one thing wraps around all of it. And then you get to James. And James is just kind of like fortune cookies over and over and over and over and over again, right? He, he, he starts to bring up things two to three times uh, in, in a book at random times. So he'll talk about something in chapter one and then drop it to move to other things and then he'll get to chapter three and it'll come back up again and it just seems like he's ranting at times, right? Such, you know, trials is one of those. The, 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 the idea of trials comes up in James over and over again. We talked about it as, as a unit when we opened the, the book last week, but we're going to see that keep coming back up over the next eight, nine weeks as we continue through the book. And so the book is less of a cohesive letter and more of a series of kind of off-the-cuff wisdom for Christian life, right? And there's no small group of scholars because of that that actually suggest and argue that James could be considered wisdom literature type of work in terms of genre, right? Even though it's a, a letter, an, an epistle, a general epistle. And, and, and so in some circles, James, the book, is actually compared to and called the New Testament Proverbs. Because right? when we read the book of Proverbs, it reads like a whole bunch of biblical fortune cookies. Right? This is good. Smart is the man who does this. Foolish is the man who does this. And then it just kind of moves on. And there's structure, but not really. Right? And so... As we continue, we want to keep that in mind because we'll jump to a whole host of topics. And so as we go through James, if you see your, your pastor go scatterbrained, it's not me, I blame James. It's not, not every day you get to blame the Bible for something, right? But today we do. So this morning, there, there's quite a few points to be made in our next set of 10 verses. And so let's stand together, and we'll be in James 1. Uh, yesterday, or last week, we started the first eight verses, so we'll continue today in looking at verses 9 through 18. Let's read James chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. 
For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls or fails or falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's the word of the Lord. Have a seat. So, so James be- begins this whole thing by offering a, a sort of a, a paradox, right? He, he compares and contrasts those who he calls lowly to those who he calls rich. And he tells those who are lowly that they should boast in what he refers to as their exaltation. And, and those who are rich, they also should boast, but they should boast in their humiliation. It's kind of a, a weird phrase, right? And, and what James is trying to do here, you know, is this another passage about rich people getting into heaven in a hard way or almost having an impossible time getting into heaven? Does this kind of have echoes of the eye through the, you know, the, the camel through the eye of a needle type of language? Is that what this is about? Well, kind of, but not exactly, right? James is expounding here on his previous verses where he talks about being under trial. And he's also speaking to a very specific context in terms of the kind of reader that James is addressing. And those both come into play when we are looking at what this whole thing is supposed to be all about. This keeps cutting out on me. So can I get next slide? <laughs> I'll just say next slide. There we go. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. First, we have to remember that James is talking to Christians everywhere, but he's writing from Jerusalem, right? He's running the home base church after Jesus' ascension. He's the pastor, kind of the senior pastor in, in the Jerusalem church, and the gospel continues to spread around the region, but he's focused there, and his audience is full of those who are suffering immense pressure and persecution as Christians. It's still a, a Jewish-dominated region, and so th- those who are Christians are small. They are the minority by a long stretch, and they are constantly made fun of at best and persecuted and hurt at worst for the beliefs that they hold. Their faith is causing them all kinds of issues. Right? For one, it's changing their social standing in significant ways. Whatever prominence in town that they once enjoyed as a, as a Jewish person, if they converted to Christianity, they've lost all social credit. But even beyond that, there's some economic issues as well. Because if you have a chance as a, as a Jewish person to do business with a, a Jew or a Christian, guess who you're going to pick? And so there's ways in which the Christians are economically persecuted and disenfranchised as well. And so it, it kind of became synonymous in Jerusalem that if you were a Christian in this time, you were lowly, even if you might have been high in status before, whether it's social, you know, social, blah, social or economic. So you're kind of bumped down a whole bunch of ladders. Maybe you were a wealthy person with a lot of you know, influence in town. That influence and wealth is likely to be gone. You are struggling. You are lowly. And many followers were shunned socially in the marketplace. And so they found themselves even sometimes destitute. And so James is is looking at those folks and telling them that they ought to boast in their exaltation. Next slide. What on earth, right? What, 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 What would you boast in as a lowly person? What is the exaltation, right? If they are lowly, then what exactly is James telling them to find their boasting in? Because he's not saying find joy in your exaltation. He's not telling them to have joy despite their circumstances. He's actually calling them to boast, to brag about something, right? And if you're a person who's financially and socially destitute where you live, what is it that you have publicly to boast or brag about? 
Right? And the key is to understand what James means by the word exaltation. James is not referring to any status that they experience in any kind of a worldly form. Instead, James is referring to the promise of their exaltation in Christ in the life to come. Right? But what's interesting is that James doesn't refer to the exaltation as a, as a future or, or a coming thing, but as a present thing. He says, boast in your exaltation. Not boast in the fact that someday you will be exalted. Boast in your present exaltation. That is a, that is a word that in the original language is very much in the present sense. Right? Boast in this exaltation that you have in Christ. And this is meant for the hearers, for the readers, to exude a confidence. The exaltation hasn't actually happened yet, but it might as well have in the eyes of James. Because James means to, to tell them that Jesus will exalt those who follow him. And James believes that it's so true, it's as if it's already happened. Right? Like when we say amen, yes and amen, it's, it's already so. May it be so. May it already be this way. Right? So James telling them to boast in their exaltation is James calling them to boast in something that isn't yet as if it already is to be that confident in that the fact that it will come one of these days so that they should boast as if they already have it. Right? There's not a whole lot of things in life that we boast about that we don't yet have as if they're already a sure thing. Right? That usually makes us look foolish when it doesn't pan out the way that we think it's going to, but not so for James. He exhorts his fellow lowly Christians to live into the identity that they are promised but don't yet have because it is as good as done. Next. And so, so the lowly people are, are offered this, this, this chance of coming out of their loneliness and, and boasting to those around them in the exaltation that they have. And the other thing to note is that the exaltation is not something that the lowly have accomplished or done in any way on their own. It's an exterior exaltation. They aren't boasting in their accomplishment. They are boasting in Christ crucified and Christ alone. And either way, though, James speaks to a people who have gone and are going through trials. And so he says to them, boast because all of this that you experience is temporary. And there's a day of exaltation in your future that is so certain and so sure that you can count on it with every facet of your life. It's a message of encouragement to his fellow believers who are suffering trials at this given moment. Next. He, after that, he addresses the rich. And the rich address is a little bit strange in some ways because he calls them to boast as well. He doesn't say to the rich like most rich, anti-rich passages tend to do of, you know, rich, worry about your status. Rich, be, be very scared, be very afraid. It's, it's harder for a camel to go. No, he tells the rich to boast as well, but not in an exaltation, but in a humiliation. Anybody here ever feel like boasting in your humiliation? That seems like a very strange, almost contradictory phrase. Right? But what, what James is referring to here is not a humiliation in the sense of embarrassment, but humiliation in the sense of humbling. Right? He's telling them to boast in their humbling of status which is very different than boast in your embarrassment. And then he goes on to tell the rich why they should boast in their humiliation. It's because this, because the flower, like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Just like the grass falls under the scorching heat of the sun, so the rich man will fade away. So in a, in a way, this kind of serves as a, a warning to, to rich people who are Christians, but that's not what the text is actually emphasizing. Next. What we're getting at here, we get a sense of it when we go to verse 12. James, again, is reiterating the importance of steadfastness under trial when we get to verse 12. But then he says, he says this. Let's read the verse again together real quick. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test of time, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Right? The promise that God gives to those who stand the test of time of, time, of trials is the crown of life. And it would seem like this is a blessing 
right, that were given in the next life. That's what James is trying to say. If you stand steadfast in this life, despite all your circumstances, all the things that happen to you, good or bad, if you walk in the Lord and you remain steadfast, when, when you breathe your last and you, you come face to face with the Lord in judgment, right, he will give you the crown of life. But there's an interesting passage towards the very end of, of Scripture that deals with crowns. And it helps us to begin to understand what James is trying to do here. Let's look at Revelation 4, 9 through 11 real quick up on the screen. This is the very beginning of John's vision in the book of Revelation. He has finished addressing the letters to the churches and he's taken up into kind of a, a trance, into a, a dream, and he's able to see the things that God wants him to see. And one of the first things he sees is the, the throne room of heaven. And he sees there Jesus sitting on the throne. And so the picture that we get is what's happening around those and with those who are seeing Jesus on the throne. Here's starting in verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is sealed on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Next. We see the, the preview of what heaven's going to look like, right? There's this picture of the, the throne room and all of its glorious majesty, and whenever people begin to, to worship, what we hear is that the 24 elders, the people cast, they take their crowns, that they are wearing in heaven, and they cast them at the foot of Jesus. And there's a couple things about this that's interesting. James sets it up, this crown of life, in, in chapter 1 as the height of possession, right? Get, get rid of all ideas of anything else. Put all your desires aside. Pursue steadfastness, because the ultimate goal ought to be that you get the crown of life that Jesus could give to you. And then we see in heaven, those who have the crown, all of a sudden, when they confront themselves with Jesus on the throne, they cast their crowns. And what's strange is that they're not asked to do so. It doesn't say, and then the Lord requested their crowns and they begrudgingly handed them over, clamping onto them until the very last second. No, they just toss them voluntarily, right? And so here's, here's what it is. As if in comparison to what they are experiencing, the crowns just aren't worth it anymore. It's almost like they have their crown, but Jesus is just better. Next. So let's put this all together. James is not trying to compare lowly and rich people. Even in the kingdom of God, he's not even trying to describe the, the hardship of a rich person to enter the, the kingdom of heaven. He's not getting, getting downtrodden on rich people or poor people. What James is doing is addressing the question of earthly status period, and regardless of what it is, good, bad, ugly, phenomenal, wealthy, poor, socially influential, destitute, it doesn't matter. To the lowly, he says, your status that you're currently experiencing and suffering through is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Your reality is exaltation in the next life. That's what you have to, to look forward to. No matter how bad or how low it gets, for you in this world, exaltation is coming, and you can only go up from here when Jesus steps in. And so the rich person, he's saying, humiliation is coming. A humbling is coming. All the stuff that you have that you put faith and trust in, none of it will make the trip to the next life. Congratulations on having amassed all of it, but it's also irrelevant. Just like the lowly person's lack of status is irrelevant to their position in heaven, so your high status is also irrelevant. And all the stuff you have, none of it will get to the next life. And so God will strip you bare, and that's actually a good thing. Because Jesus is better than all the stuff. And when you get to stand face to face with him, even if somehow you got to keep it, you're not going to want it. So don't boast in your stuff. Boast in the one who will take it away someday and allow you to understand and experience what really matters, what really has eternal significance, what's really, truly important. Next. 
See, James is, is trying to tell people that status on earth is entirely irrelevant to the equation. Whatever your status is right now, it's not coming with you. If you have nothing in heaven, you'll have everything. If you have much or all of the things that you could possibly ever hope or wish for, they'll all be stripped from you before you enter. You'll be humbled down. And trust me when I tell you that humbling might seem painful for a second, but on the other end, you're not going to be annoyed by it. There is nothing you could amass in this world that you will miss on the other side of heaven. There's no level of security, of retirement funding, of, of wealth, of status, of prominence. There is nothing that you could achieve or amass in this life, nothing, that when you are confronted with Christ, you would look at and go, I still want some of that. When you see Christ in his fullness and who he is, those things will just become irrelevant to you, right? But trust James when he tells you, you are not going to care because Jesus is so grand, even the crown of life will seem meaningless to you when you see him. You'll, just, you'll cast anything you have at him. It's like the, the parable of the pearl of great price, right? When the person who has all these things discovers the pearl, he goes and he sells off all he has so that he can buy the land that has the pearl on it so that he can have the pearl. Once you see Jesus, everything else just becomes meaningless. And if you are holding on to stuff today, it's because you haven't yet had the experience of seeing Jesus in all of his fullness and his glory and his radiance sitting on the throne. It's because you have a, a picture, an image of Jesus in your head that is so far from the whole accurate picture of who he is and how much significance he bears to you and how glorious he is. Trust me if you knew, if you could see Jesus with the, eyes of the, the stained eyes of sin removed from you, you would toss everything you've got by the wayside and just run. No one would have to tell you, compel you, ask you, remind you. He would just toss it and run. Everything and everyone you've ever loved, which is just becomes, and you just, just would run. That's how grand Jesus is. And even if somehow you could take it all with you, you wouldn't. You'd forget it behind you as you ran. Next. So, so the lesson here is not to worry about your status. Either way. Regardless of where you find yourselves, maybe you are in a position where you are just the lowest of the low. You've never felt worse than you feel right now. And what, what he's trying to tell you is it doesn't matter. There's a reality of you that is so highly exalted and so far ahead of what you could ever understand or imagine. Just, just keep running the race. Just, just keep being steadfast. All of this is temporary. Right? Maybe you're living a life of comfort and you have a reliance on the things of this world. It doesn't matter. If that's where you put your faith and your hope and your trust... That's what you're going to be left with, right? Those things are not of significance, right? But it's funny, we, we pursue those things. It's the, the next life we should invest in and not the current, but how many of us really do that well, if we're honest with ourselves? How much time do we spend on this life and cultivating it versus the next, right? How much... Time do we train our children to spend on this life versus the next? How many parents, whether your kids are grown and this is past conversation or they're tiny and this is years down the line or this is right around the corner for you, how many, how many parents are more focused on what the next four to ten years of their kids' lives are going to look like than what their eternity is going to look like? Right? Next. We... We just love to focus on the here and now. And James invites us to look beyond that scope. He says that if, if you're lowly and you're experiencing hardship, hold fast. It's a temporary thing. If you're experiencing bountiful everything and you never have a worry in your life, you know, those things aren't going to be mattering to you anymore anyway. They're going to be stripped away. You're not going to get to keep them in the next life. And if you, if you put your eggs in that basket, it's not going to pan out well for you. So, so enjoy those things. Be glad that you've been blessed with much, but take responsibility for it and, and use it in a way that glorifies and edifies God's kingdom because ultimately that is a fruit that does come with you. you have a million dollars in your bank account and you die and you get to heaven, that million dollars is useless. 
If you have a million dollars invested in cultivating people with the hope of the gospel, and you get to heaven and you can see that there's all these people that God has used you to reach, that's the kind of thing that comes with you. See, James is just trying to get his people who are suffering to think in terms of eternal, not just in the immediate, when we are so naturally prone to focus in the immediate. And he concludes kind of this section by talking about a seemingly off-brand topic. Right? He, jumps, he jumps a little bit and he moves when he gets to, to verse 13 there to talk about temptation. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God can't be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire and then desire when it's conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. This kind of doesn't seem to fit with this talk about lowly and highly exalted people, but this is one of those conversational bumps, but James is trying to communicate three important things in this small little set of verses. Number one, everyone experiences temptation. Right? He doesn't say if, but he says when tempted. Right? And so the, the first truth here is that temptation is something that befalls all of us. And by the way, temptation is, is not something that's sinful. Right? We can look in, in the Gospels and we can see that Jesus himself experienced temptation. Right? So, so the, the temptation itself is not an act of sinfulness. When you experience a, a draw towards something that is away from, from God, that is a part of the natural life that we have, it's not sinful to be tempted away from the Lord. Right? What's sinful is to, to act on it. And that's the next thing that we have to understand. There's a very big difference between trials and temptations. Right? Trials are things that just happen to us. You might be going through a struggle that is not entirely of your own doing at all, then it's just hard. And maybe it's something God is using to, to shape you. Maybe it's just a result of a sinful world as we talked about last week. But temptation is different. Temptation is when the, the, sta the status that you are in, whatever you find yourself in, in terms of life right in this moment, is causing you to look anywhere else but the Lord for satisfaction and joy. Right? So when we start to get frustrated with our current circumstance, we want to do something about it because our eyes are focused on the immediate. See, these two passages who are seemingly just James jumping around actually relate because here's what he's saying. If you don't heed my words and if you don't move away from just what's in front of you to what's eternal, that's when temptation comes. That's when, that's when the enemy starts to prowl. I'm of low status. Well, you know, if God was really all-powerful or loved you, you probably wouldn't be in that status. It's a lie straight from the pit of hell, but when we focus on what's in front of us rather than what's promised to us with a yes and amen, right, that's when temptation starts to come in because we want to start to pick ourselves up and, and change those things apart from what God is calling us to do or how he's calling us to be. When we focus on the exaltation promised ahead and when we live with a steadfastness and a confidence that that exaltation is coming regardless of what's happening right here and right now, that's when temptation becomes easier to get around, to dismiss to let the word of the Lord wash over you and to say to Satan, get behind me. Not today. Right? And that's what he, he ends by, by, by telling us that God created us for. Right? Don't be deceived. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of a first fruits to his creatures that we ought to be a people that are heaven and kingdom focused. That when your circumstances are tough, you say, this isn't all there is. This is temporary. There's something bigger coming. I'm not going to be swayed left or right by the, by the circumstances of my current life. I'm going to trust in the hope of the future that God gives me. And there will be years where things are great in this world, and there will be years when things are immensely hard in this world. And the longer you've lived, the longer you know that that just ebbs and flows. Right? If you're currently riding on a high wave, and you are anything over the age of, let's say, 50, 60, you know that wave's not lasting forever. Right? You know you're going you're to come crashing down at some point. And if you're in the lowest of lows and you think there's no way out, 
right? Those of us who are more seasoned in life probably know that it's not, that's not true. There's, there's a hope coming, right? Life ebbs and flows. And if our decisions ebb and flow with it, if our hope and trust ebbs and flows with it, we're tossed aside, as he said last week, in the wind and the waves. And instead, James says, don't, don't worry about what's current. Worry about what's coming. Don't be tempted to pull away from the Lord because of your current circumstance. But hold fast. Right? Hold fast in him. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Many of us are experiencing real hardship today. Many of us are, are experiencing things in life that are causing us to wonder if you're even there for us at all. And sometimes it's so easy to just wonder, where's the hope? Is there any? Are you working? What are you doing? Are you even real? And Lord, you promise us that in this life we might face trials, but you also promise us that in the end there is an exaltation. So God, we rejoice and we boast in that identity, not made by us, not earned by us, but given as a gift by you. And we pray We pray that you would empower us through your spirit to press into that identity. That when life gets hard, you would empower us to say with a bold confidence, this is not all there is. There's something coming that I can't even imagine that's so good that would cause me to throw aside every good thing I've ever known for the sake of your kingdom. So we pray that you remind us of that in the hard times, that you don't let us forget in the darkness what we've learned in the light, and that you continue to empower us to press more and more into the reality that you are creating for us in the new heavens and the new earth. And Lord, we long for that day, and we ask that it comes soon. As we see the vision alongside of John of people casting their crowns, we long for the day where we get to stand before your throne, and we get to cast our own crowns. May that day be sooner rather than later. We love you and we praise you. And all his people said, amen.